Hello, uh, good morning everyone. My name is uh, Enrique del Rey Castillo. I am the chair of uh, this session, session 4B. Uh, we have uh, four presentations, uh, Kevin Cowie, Dave, Dave McGigan, uh, Richard Walker, and Mark uh, Rayburn. Um, we'll start with uh, Kevin Cowie. The presentations are 25 minutes, about 20 minutes presentation and five minutes um, questions. Um, Kevin is a senior structural engineer at Steel Construction New Zealand. He's a charter professional engineer and uh, engineering New Zealand charter member. Kevin is an author of a number of uh, New Zealand steel structure design guides and has assisted consultants throughout New Zealand in the preparation of many multi-level steel construction design options. He sits on a number of standards, Australia and standards New Zealand committees, and he is currently the chair of the committee to revise NZS 3404 steel structure standards. Thank you, Kevin. All right, good morning, everyone. It's great to be here. I'm certainly enjoying being at this conference and hearing a lot of uh, very interesting and uh, speakers over the course of a couple of days. And um, it's a really privilege to be able to share some of the work that uh, we've been doing at, at Steel Construction New Zealand. So first of all, I'd like to acknowledge my uh, co-author, Alistair Fussell. Um, together, we put together uh, the, the paper, which is, uh, is available for you to have a, a look at. So this is a uh, quite a specialized topic. Um, it's to do with steel and uh, in particular a connection type and, and some de new proposed uh, provisions that we're intending to put in the steel structure standard NZS 3404. So where are we going in this uh, uh, presentation? Um, it's really a, quite a simple presentation, give you a bit of an introduction, a bit of a background, what's block shear, um, why are we um, uh, developing this paper, what's the purpose of it, and then we'll go into the, the, the uh, details of the proposed block shear provisions for 3404. And then I'll look at the implications of how does that affect you in your design practice. Will it um, uh, mean a, a different way of, of uh, connection capacity, or are we looking at pretty much business as usual? Okay, so what is block shear? <laughs> Essentially, it's really, it's a rupture of a block of material in a bolted connection. Um, so we've got a rupture at the tension phase and, and a, a shear failure uh, along the, the shear plane there. So you, uh, depending on your, your connection configurations, you can have different um, uh, modes of uh, block shear failure. Um, you, yeah, and different amounts of material that, that gets ruptured. And here is just two examples of uh, block shear failure in steel connections. So when it comes to looking at your models or your design provisions for block shear, it's all to do with um, do you take the gross or do you take the net planes in terms of your, um, your, in your design equations? So, um, uh, here is illustrated um, the gross planes here, so it, it's um, excluding the, um, uh, the the bolt hole area, or you do, or you do to take the net plane, which is the, you know that net area between the bolt holes, and different uh, design provisions around the world um, use uh, different amounts of um, combinations of gross and net uh, planes. So um, you may be thinking, don't we have block shear provisions in 3404? Well, actually, we don't. Um, it is not in there. Um, and currently, uh, 3404 is up for revision. Uh, end of last year, there was a group of, uh, of us we, uh, established a committee uh, to look at uh, reviewing uh, what needs to be updated in 3404. Um, there was a good cross representatives of practicing engineers, input from the universities and industry personnel. And we went through pretty much the section by section of the standard identifying areas that needed to be updated. So this is actually um, quite an extensive update. Um, that scope has now been prepared. It's been submitted to MB and it's been accepted and with a, some slight tweaking to it. 
And one of the um, areas that was identified is, is in terms of the connections, in terms of the block shear, that there was a desire to put some block shear uh, specific provisions in the steel structure standard. Okay, so if we've got a desire to have it in it, um, can we not just borrow something from an overseas standard? Well, if you look at overseas standards, if you look at the American Institute of Steel Construction, if you look at the Australian standard, the Canadian standard, the Euro code, and the Japanese one, and what's currently being used in our SNZ Steel Connect, you see there's quite a variability in, in design provisions. Um, so there's no consensus worldwide on what the, uh, the, what the box shear provision should be. And even if you look at the American Institute of Steel Construction, you'll see that um, every few years they've tended to change their block shear provisions. It's been, um, what, What's currently in Steel to Connect is actually the 1986 AISC uh, block shear provisions, but that has been changed about three or four times since 1986. The uh, Australians uh, in 2012, essentially they just um, took what was in the American Institute of Steel Construction specification and put that in their standard. Um, the Canadians, um, they've They've got a, a different stand, uh, provisions there, um, and it tended to provide a, a slightly higher block shear capacities. The Euro code uh, tends to be on a very conservative side and provide um, a lot less capacity, and the, the, the Japanese is somewhere in the middle. So which one's most appropriate? Well, when we looked at what should be included in, in 3404, what we did is that not only did we look at what was in the standards around the world, but what's the latest research has been conducted in this area. And what we discovered that Professor Lip T for, uh, at Wollongong University has been doing a lot of research in this area over the last few years. And in 2017, he combined with uh, Greg, Professor Greg Deerling from, uh, in the United States, and they put together a paper that was published in the American Institute of Steel Construction Engineering Journal in 2017. And what they, what they um, uh, when they undertake the research, was that they discovered that the shear planes um, uh, lie somewhere between the effective and be between the, the net and gross shear plane. So it's uh, midway between those two points. And so they came up with this alternative um, block shear provision where um, you're based on, you know, you, um, on the, what would they call the effective uh, shear plane area. And that's essentially just an average of the gross and net shear plane for the, for the shear um, proponent of this equation. So we've got this um, new proposed equation. How does this compare to actually uh, data? So um, Professor uh, Lipti and uh, Greg Deerling, um, they looked at all the data that's been, and all the test data that has been done over a number of years. So they looked at data from 1985, 2014, and collected all that. You can see it's quite a bit of testing that has been done on block shear over the years. And then they compared the current American Institute of Steel Construction design provisions against what they're proposed. So, um, what they found was that their proposed equation matched very closely um, uh, to the test data and that the American Institute, uh, the current AISC provisions was conservative by about 20%. So that, that, that was very encouraging in terms of their uh, procedure. And so um, they also looked at different modes of failure in terms of block shear. You know, they looked at um, the conventional, um, where it's a pull out of material, or, and they also looked at a split model where the, it's the uh, sides of the connections that, that, that t uh, rupture. And so they looked at um, test data that specifically covered those areas, um, and, and they compared it not just according to the AIC uh, provisions, but they also compared it against the uh, other international uh, design standards. Um, in this table here, equation six is the, is the proposed one, and so it, what it showed was that both conventional and split model, um, the, 
The proposed um, equation matched very closely to test data. What this table does show is um, you know, the Canadian design provision is actually unconservative slightly. Um, show that the European one was um, you know, approximately 30% um, conservative, um, and the Japanese one at about 11%. But definitely the, that their proposed equation um, matched very closely to test data. As part of the exercise, um, Professor uh, Lipti also looked at um, the impact of eccentric loading and non-uniform stress distributions. If you've looked at um, block shear provisions internationally, you see that a number of these design provisions apply a reduction factor of 0.5 if you have a, a double uh, column uh, of bolts um, in, your, in your connection, um, indicating that there's non-uniform stress. Um, when they actually um, compared the, their, their um, uh, proposed equation against um, some test data, they found that they, they didn't actually need to provide this reduction factor. But they weren't um, confident enough, there wasn't enough data in their subset to be able to confidently recommend their, their, um, their model. So at the, at the end of it, um, Professor Lipti and Greg Deerling they propose to keep the, uh, what's currently done in other international standards of applying a 0.5 reduction factor um, for a double column rule uh, of bolts. So now we've got that factor. Uh, the last part of the equation of, um, is what capacity reduction factor should be applied. And um, this was actually looked at, again, uh, by um, Professor Lipti. And they did a, a reliability analysis based on work by driver in uh, Canada. And um, they came up with a, a number of 0.85. Um, how does that compare to what's currently been used? Well, AIC uses 0.75. The Australians have just copied that, 0.75. Interesting to know, previously in Steel Connect, we used 0.9, which was taken from an earlier Australian Steel Institute publication, um, and uh, it was used in Australia of 0.9, even though the, the same equation used in America was 0.75. But if we just go back to the, um, the mathematics of the statistical reliability, 0.85 seems to be the appropriate uh, capacity reduction factor to use. So what's been proposed in 3404? Um, essentially, what we did is that we looked at the current clause in AS4100, and we tried to mirror that as much as possible by introducing the, um, the, uh, the proposed equation from Lipti and Greg Deerlin. So uh, blowing that up, we have a capacity factor of 0.85 being applied. This is your design equation, uh, nominal design capacity. Uh, KBS, that's your, your um, non-uniform uh, eccentric loading factor. That would be, commonly would be one if you just have a single column of bolts. Um, if you have a double one, that, that'd be 0.5. Multiply by your, your tensile capacity, multiply the net area, and the second part of the equation is your 0.6 times uh, your uh, tensile strength times your effective area in the shear, which is really is just the average of your gross and your net areas. So it's quite a, a simple formula. Um, there is, um, and it's easy to be applied. So what's the implications of this um, in design? Well, as part of this, we, we looked at um, uh, two worked examples um, that has been put together. Um, the first worked example is one that you can find in the Australian Steel Institute technical note when they provided some design guidance on the new block shear that was introduced in the 2012 amendment of AS4100. So um, they, they had a, a complete worked example on that technical note, and what they found was that using the, the current provisions um, in AISC and the, and the new amendment in 4100, 
that you got a capacity of 539 kilonewtons. If we were plugged in those um, and use the, the existing Steel Connect uh, block shear provisions, you got a capacity of 675 kilonewtons. Now the proposed um, block shear provision in 344 gives you a capacity of 647, so quite close to um, the existing capacity of Steel Connect, but uh, uh, significantly higher um, than what's in the AIC and, and in the Australian standard. Second example uh, comparison. So this is an example taken from the paper of um, uh, Lipti and Greg Deerling. Um, and what, what it's shown is that the AS4100 and AIC uh, provision gave you 921 kilonewtons of uh, block shear capacity. Compare that to the current steel connect of 1,241. The Proles equation gave you slightly higher than the steel connect of 1,246. So essentially, the proposed equation and what's currently in steel connect get, is approximately um, gives you about the same values. So that's quite encouraging because that means that the, all their current um, uh, pre-engineered connections in steel connect, um, you're probably likely that you're not having to redesign those connections. You're, you, you're more than likely to be able to keep with the same um, uh, configurations for that. Now this example also showed that using this uh, larger capacity that you can reduce the number of bolts in their connection. And so you, get, you get, get, got some efficiency um, and, um, and, um, in, the, in this type of uh, design. So in conclusion, um, the proposed block shear provisions of T and Deerlane in the 2017 IEIC Engineering Journal is recommended for inclusion in 3404. Um, it is the most accurate compared to existing data. Um, uh, and when you compare it to other international standards, um, other international standards don't come as close. Um, I've compared it to two worked examples and it gives approximately the same answer as the current Steel Connect. Just a, a few acknowledgements. Um, in, in looking at um, the proposed equations, I, I had extensive con uh, conversations with Associate Professor Greg McRae, and we had conversations together with uh, Professor Lipti at <coughs> University of Wollongong. So we, we went in depth in terms of looking at all the research behind it and really um, quizzed and, and, and um, Lipti in terms of uh, his research. And we were quite satisfied at, after that that the, it, certainly that this proposed model um, has a solid uh, uh, basis for rec recommending to 3404 committee. Um, subsequent to that conversation, we had a conversation with uh, Associate Professor Charles Clifton, and lo and behold, he's already been using it in his um, engineering lectures for his, for his students for the last few years. So he's, he's been ahead of us, um, and he's more than comfortable in, in using this equation for block shear. So all of all, I think uh, I have a quite a high degree of confidence that this would be a uh, uh, suitable for 3404, and we'll recommend this to the, the committee for consideration. If you have... Um, any feedback or uh, when you have the opportunity to look at the paper in more detail, uh, I'm more than happy to take questions um, um, and uh, uh, have a discussion with you at a later date. Now we're a little bit early, so and we've got time for questions, thanks. Sorry, this question is probably a bit obvious, but can you just go back to example one, and what is the block shear mode with that? It just seems to me we would be more like a, an ultimate tensile fracture across. Yeah, so this one, if you look at the, um, this is from Australian Steel Institute technical note. So they looked at, um, actually two modes of block shear failure. 
One was um, a, uh, like you, you say, more of a, a tensile rupture of that face with a very short um, uh, shear failure planes on, on the side. But they also looked at the combination of, of splitting as well. As well. So this this was the the, the governing one that I've presented. Yeah. Yeah. Is there any other question? Pierre. But when you say uh, splitting, is it kind of a row shear? Yes. So yeah, I'll see if I can find the diagram. Okay. Ah, is it? Um, ah, here it is. Okay, so what it is, so this is a conventional would be this block of material ruptures. So splitting is when it's, it's the edge block of material that splits off. So, and this one here, so that's one block shear would be essentially the, the, the material, the three bolts, and you got a shear plane and a shear plane. The other one where, yeah, you could have, um, yeah, tension and then shear across. Yeah. Um, so you, you're talking about the middle one here? Yeah, the middle one, there has to be failure in the middle one as well. Yeah. Yeah, I'll just have to refresh myself. It, it is covered in the, the Australian Steel technical note really well. And I, I, and I just can't, um, at the moment, I can't quite um, describe it to you very well, but I can, I can show it to you after this presentation. Yep. Okay. Um, so please join me um, helping uh, thanking Kevin for his presentation. Uh, next we have um, Dave McGigan. Uh, Dave is the technical director at Conkey New Zealand. He performs a number of duties at Conkey New Zealand, including convening the precast and reinforcing processor industry, industry groups. Dave is also the quality manager for the Conkey New Zealand plant audit scheme. And prior to joining Conkey New Zealand in 2018, Dave was the deputy chief engineer at the New Zealand building regulator. Uh, Dave's background is as a structural engineer working both in New Zealand and overseas. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Enrique. So, two things I'm going to cover today. The new specification for concrete production, NZS 3104, and the concrete NZ plant audit scheme. I'd also like to acknowledge my co-writers, James McKechnie, Rob Gamester, and Adam Leach, my also colleagues at Concrete NZ. And just coincidentally, James McKechnie is here, but he's presenting right now in the corrosion stream. So. Uh, He's also obviously a font of wealth and knowledge in this whole uh, area of concrete in the New Zealand industry. Is this? Okay. So this new um, specification of concrete production, it was issued April 2021. It supersedes the previous version from 2003. The revision process commenced in October 2018, so it took about two and a half years, which was a bit longer than anticipated, but uh, yeah, as, as any stands process is prone to, it always takes a bit longer than en envisaged. What's probably a little bit different is that Concrete NZ funded and project managed the um, up revision. This was partly to manage costs, so we sort of got a better uh, industry cost um, deal in terms of, but it did mean we did all the convening at meetings and also did all the editing in the document. 
So a little bit different to maybe how other standards processes typically run, where uh, Standards New Zealand do all the meeting, convening, and all the editing as it progresses. It was chaired by Dr James McKechnie, my colleague at Concrete NZ, and CESOC was ably represented by Sue Freytag from WSP. So maybe just taking it back a step, what is NZS3104? Because I have been doing a few uh, spot quizzes around in the days I've been here in terms of people's knowledge. So it is the uh, standard that prescribes the minimum requirements for the production of fresh concrete. And it provides a means of demonstrating compliance with the New Zealand Building Code through that pathway that's illustrated there. So it's just a, uh, it's an observation. Um, you know, so NZS 3104 is referenced in concrete, the NZS 3109 concrete construction, which in turn is referenced in NZS 3101. But yeah, the observation I make that probably is a little bit different to uh, you know the parallel for reinforcing, where AS NZS 4671 is directly cited in 3101. So it's sort of one question that uh, I keep internally asking, and maybe there is a smoother pathway, and it would then align maybe with other. Uh, you know, uh, concrete standards, I've seen other jurisdictions which typically reference the concrete production standard as a secondary standard as opposed to here in New Zealand it's a tertiary standard. So, uh, yes, say just an observation. So what were the drivers to make a change? So one of the key ones was to address sustainability. Uh, yes, because concrete, um, we do know, does get a bit of a... Uh, um, I guess uh, observations around its uh, performance and uh, sustainable credentials, so it's well acknowledged and I know I sat in a sustainability session yesterday and it sort of was well good to see that you know it is recognised that uh, concrete industry is doing what it can, there will be incremental steps and this is one way that we are making a, some difference. So on that note it provides increased incentives for concrete batching plants that demonstrate rigorous, prediction con uh, rigorous production control. And it's all part, also part of Concrete New Zealand strategy to ensure the concrete industry standards maintain currency. Because there is a bit of a challenge there. You, know, you can scan across the family of standards. We talked about 3109, it's a 1997 standard. So it's sort of again pointing to some stuff as the need of an update or otherwise check its relevance. Um, yeah, because there is about 25 concrete standards, so there is a bit of an uh, element of upkeep there. So then just uh, what has changed, so just at a high level though, the overall structure of the document remains the same. So if you, just to give you an overview of the, uh, how the document is presented, it's got four key sections. Um, so you've got the front end, the general, which has got your scope, definitions, abbreviations. And then the key section, section two, the provisions for ready mix concrete, when that covers off also normal and special. Then there's a third section, provisions for prescribed mixed concrete, which I think has sort of actually gone out of vogue and is probably hardly used in a normal you know, concrete production. And then finally a section on concrete mixes, so it's got provisions for stationary truck and continuous mixes. So then now looking at what is the key changes. So this summarises it. Um, and about uh, five or six uh, key bullet points. So we've got daily moisture content measurements for fine aggregates. So that helps with the uh, dosing of water, as uh, it often you know, can be influenced by how wet aggregates are in the, as they're stored. Increased frequency of yield testing of concrete. So this helps give a picture of the density in terms of you know, under or over cement proportions so that uh, it can calibrate that you are getting you know, the right amount of cement in the concrete. Now there is a mandatory requirement for seven day strength testing. This was actually largely being done anyway by most of the major producers, but it's now mandatory and all the um, concrete producers that uh, make concrete in accordance with 3104 have to perform this. And this helps with early identification of any issues of the concrete in a more consistent basis. Now we've got uh, incentives for concrete plants with excellent production control, and this is for those that consistently you know, get above a target strength, and this can then help them uh, reduce the amount of cement, and again has got you know, benefits from sustainability and also cost. 
And then and also in the sustainability theme, there is now also provisions that support longer term strength testing when using supplementary cementitious materials and concrete production. But these will still be a special concrete. So we are, and the concrete industry is trying to just actually kick off a project to normalise it more, because you're going to hear more about this, you know, the um, aspects of concrete trying to do its own uh, part in reducing emissions. So supplementary cementitious materials, they can help displace the uh, conventional cement, and we will try and encourage that and try and allow that to be more mainstream. Um, and industry will also lead that in terms of they also will want to drive market advantage and get the right products out there that help support having using concrete. So you'll start to see some new products probably come through various um, media or uh, product release from various uh, companies. And then there's also a big focus on editing just to improve clarity from the previous edition. So what's next? So acknowledging it's sort of relatively new, only been out three months, so there's the process that the batching plants are still transitioning to new requirements. We will, as a concrete industry, be doing more seminars and education and targeting other conferences, just to make sure, especially that the ready mix producers are aware of the new standard requirements. It's probably also a note to consultants and their structural specifications to update them to reference this new version in the you know, fullness of time or as soon as possible, but acknowledging there's probably still a bit of uh, transition between the current 3104 and the previous 3104. And then, of course, how it fits into the wider regulatory or you know, the um, building code system documents. So um, acknowledging that 3109, there's no immediate uh, game plan to review that, but it will hopefully come through in the fullness of time too, that that all follows suit and those documents get amended to reflect there is a new, this, 2021 version of 3104. So now I'm going to change topic and move on to the Concrete New Zealand Plant Audit Scheme. So this has actually been around for a while. It's been around in various guises since 1963 and otherwise it was formally branded as the New Zealand Ready Mix Concrete Association Plant Audit Scheme and has recently transitioned to become the Concrete New Zealand Plant Audit Scheme. And that's partly related to the legacy concrete associations all consolidating in 2017. So it's just one preface here, just to, um, I'm not here to be a salesman, but there are recognising that, um, you know, there's many ways to demonstrate compliance with the building code. And I was at my previous role at uh, MV and the building regulator as well versed in putting out that line. but. You know, it's not mandatory to actually sign up to this scheme, but it has got a uh, certainly a market penetration, and batching plants may well choose another method to show compliance with 3104 if that's what they choose. Um, but it does have obviously a good market penetration. It's got 189 plants located across New Zealand that are part of the scheme. Uh, that's, the, so that's the current count. It does fluctuate a bit, but. Um, yeah, sort of, and when you look, do look at a map in New Zealand, it's sort of got a very good um, footprint, matches, you know, the outline of New Zealand. So what it does, it provides an independent audit of the quality systems in place at a batching plant to verify that the plant is producing concrete in accordance with 3104. So it helps give consultants, clients, um, contractors a surety that the concrete they're um, putting on the project is in accordance with the 3104 requirements. It's also certified independently to ISO 9001 and is independently audited on an annual basis by Bureau Veritas. So just an overview of the key requirements to be an audited plant. So you must comply with the requirements of NZS 3104. Each batching plant must have a qualified plant engineer and the qualifications are outlined as CPNG or a chartered member of Engineering New Zealand or a registered engineering associate, an appropriately qualified employee who carries out testing, and you must maintain proper records of production and testing and submit re frequent reports on a quarterly basis to the um, administrator of the plant audit scheme to ensure that uh, the records are kept and are transparent. 
So just how the scheme operates. So the plants are audited on a regular basis and the audits are performed by experienced and qualified auditing engineers. So this includes reviewing the test records and undertaking a site visit of a batching plant on a two year cycle. So you, I'll show that in the next slide, but um, we have a, a site assessment in year one, a paper, a paper assessment year two, and that just process just repeats. And then on the back of these submitted reports, the plant audit committee, they meet quarterly to review the audit reports for the batching plants in each zone. So New Zealand's divided into four zones just to help with the administration. So it roughly divides into about 40 to 45 plants per zone. And then they go through a process of deciding if the batching plants for that zone should be issued a certificate of audit as per 3104, or if they need to action any identified non-conformances. So this slide here just shows you the um, uh, two yearly cycle diagram diagrammatically. Um, probably the detail might not show up at this scale, but um, yeah, the overview is that you're just going through in a constant um, process of submitting records and then going through an assessment and then meetings of the plant audit committee. And uh, so it just shows there's a structure and a logic. Um, so there he shows at the top your site assessment and your paper assessment at the high level. And then it also feeds into awards for those that actually um, exceed requirements on a regular basis. And then just drilling into a bit more detail around the performance criteria that's audited. So when they're looking at the results, they're looking into the mean concrete strengths that are recorded and the coefficient of variation, the aggregate quality by testing and monitoring that the actual equipment they're using, such as the weight measures, are calibrated and accurate, the mixer efficiency tests, so that's your you know, mixers on the batching plant, and then laboratory equipment calibration. So this is an important one where it might differ from some consultants' um, expectations because uh, the plant audit scheme actually does take responsibility for you know, reviewing that the plants have got labs that are, um, you know, got the equipment right. So there is some tension sometimes when people in these specs might call up that the lab must be an IANS or uh, National Australasian Testing Authority or TELAC accredited lab, uh, but the plant audit scheme is quite clear that they will actually um, manage that part of how the laboratory works at a batching plant. They, they look at the production and testing record keeping, uh, records of the technician training and overall plant operator performance. So when it's all successful, a certificate of audit is issued. It's always a bit of a mystery to me though why the actual certificate in our case is called a certificate of compliance, but uh, that might be another mystery I can unpick with time. So batching plants that meet the requirements of the plant audit scheme are issued a certificate of audit as per NZS 3104 quality audit section. And these must be revalidated within 12 months. Uh, for those that may have issues to rectify, an interim certificate of audit may be issued, and that's for up to three months, and that process could repeat if it's sort of an ongoing thing of uh, not rectifying that deficiency. One of the key um, things is it lists the concrete strength that it's certified to. So typically most are 50 MPA, but there's a few that sort of sit around maybe 40 MPA. Uh, and as I mentioned, that we do have an interactive map on our website that shows where all these plants are located across the country. So here's another sort of probably important aspect to cover, and this does sort of play out a bit from time to time, but what if concrete is produced by an unaudited plant? And as I probably mentioned or alluded to, you know, it's not mandatory for a concrete batching plant to hold a certificate of audit. And under that ethos of a performance-based building code, you know, there are other ways to demonstrate compliance that you meet the building code. But not to say that, you know, the majority obviously follow a pathway of uh, 
being using an audited process to you know, show that they meet 3104. But uh, if concrete is specified to meet 3104, and it, then it becomes a responsibility of the purchaser, which may be the contractor and or the designer, to establish the audit and or testing methods required to demonstrate conformance of the, with the New Zealand Building Code. So that might be sort of pointing to a first principles approach. So what you could do, these are just two options, you know, you can engage an auditing engineer to oversee the quality systems in place at the batching plant and the concrete production for the specific project. So that's again getting into maybe specific project requirements. Um, and then building on that set specific project testing requirements yourself as a consultant, taking into account the project, you know, what, what is critical. And this may require testing every load of concrete for meaningful QA, which uh, may be challenging. So it's again choosing, you know, your, the context of the project, picking your battle, so to speak. Um, sensitivities around, you know, whether it's a slab for a house versus a bottom column of a multi-storey building, you know, you might obviously just need to just check what you're uh, trying to achieve in terms of testing requirements. So a lot more information can be found on the website at that link. Um, and then, yeah, it's one, uh, another bit of housekeeping, because um, myself coming from a structural engineering background, I did a check on the legacy company I used to work at, and that referenced it as the New Zealand Ready Mix Concrete Association Plant Audit Scheme at the time. Um, and I've, again, been doing a bit of, call it, quizzing around while I've been here at the conference, and there's probably a variety of things that are happening, and I mean, some people probably don't reference it at all in their specifications. Some people probably use master spec as their um, go-to specification, and I think it doesn't necessarily point to this at all, or it allows you to enter uh, maybe free field in terms of what you might want to set as quality management for the uh, concrete aspects or concrete production. So I think there'll just be a bit of a scatter of how people manage their specifications, and that probably also follows in with 3104 being cited as well. Okay, so I've left a bit of extra time for questions as well, but that's the things I wanted to cover. So thank you. Thank you, Ben. Time for a couple of questions. I'd be um, speculating, but it'd probably be about another 20. Yeah, so it's in that order, so it's got, yeah, I just know there's one or two players that have got, you know, multiple plants that aren't part of the scheme, but, you know, that's sort of, um, that's my, yeah, guess. Yeah. I have a quick one. Yeah. Uh, you haven't mentioned anything about health and safety. Is that not part of the audit scheme? No, not explicitly, but I think it should be. Yes, good point. Yeah. <laughs> that they, uh, yeah, that might be something to dig into the documents that they have now addressed that because it's probably been a creeping in requirement. So that's a yeah, good point. So maybe I should. Good. See Thank you. Yep. Uh, yeah. Uh, thanks for the uh, hard work and uh, great to know all the hard work's going in to give us confidence in our specifications. Um, you said that the industry was positioning itself to make some improvements on sustainability and the supplementary cementitious materials. Can you just comment on sort of their availability across the industry and if we should have any like reservations specifying it because it may not be available or, or just go for it? Yeah, no, very good uh, question and it's something that I'm probably always trying to again get more upfront knowledge because it is evolving. I mean just yesterday I saw Stevenson's concrete a concrete producer based out of Auckland, they've released a product with Carbon Cure, and I've heard through second other sort of um, interactions, that's something that's pointing the way in terms of helping promote sustainable production of concrete. Um, the aspects of, you know, there's a whole aspect of uh, supplementary cementitious materials, alternative cements, you know, that really warrants another whole presentation, because it does get to be a lot of, um, uh, you know, its own whole topic, but just at a high level, you know, the um, 
key ones out there are fly ash and blast furnace slag, and sort of they are imported and bagged. And I think you know you have to talk to your concrete supplier specifically, whether it be Allied or Firth or um, being two of the big ones, but. They do have them available, and they do, um, I guess it might be just a matter of specific. Uh, the supply chain obviously is, is constantly changing. Uh, the one that will probably be interesting to see how it evolves is pozzolans. New Zealand's actually rich in that, so that's another ver variation on an alternative cement. So pozzolans are actually like volcanic byproduct, and that's really available in New Zealand. So I think but it's probably got to work through a process of being extracted and that might test the Resource Management Act. So, but we are trying to network that across the, you know, the quarrying and government agencies to sort of promote that as also as an option that can help New Zealand do its thing and you know, making better concrete. Um, but yeah, I think it does com com become a case of just talking directly with the concrete supplier and they'll be more than willing to probably share, I think, what their latest um, availability initiatives are. Um, we have now a little bit of a uh, different presentation. We have uh, first Richard Worker. Richard is a consulting charter professional engineer with 48 years of experience in the design as, and supervision of civil and structural engineering in New Zealand and overseas, including 35 years with earth wall buildings. Richard, Richard constructed his own um, adobe houses in 87 and 2002 and is the engineering New Zealand representative for the New Zealand Earth Building Standard 4297, 4298, 4299, published in 1998 and revised in 2020. And then if we have a little bit of time, uh, Hugh Morris has some uh, interesting videos of earth wall building. Hugh is a senior lecturer at the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of Auckland and he has done a lot of research on earth and timber housing and construction in the past. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to this talk about earth building. So this is about the development of the New Zealand Earth Building Standards, NZS 4297, NZS 4298, and NZS 4299, all published in 2020. So NZS 4297 is for the engineering design of earth buildings. NZS 4298 is for the materials and construction for earth building and the workmanship requirements and specifies the testing required for earth buildings. NZS 4299 is earth buildings not requiring specific engineering design and is the earth building equivalent of NZS 3604 timber frame buildings. This suite of standards was first published in 1998 and recently revised in 2020. So earth wall materials are available locally, require minimal processing and have very low embodied energy and can be returned to the earth at the end of life. The New Zealand earth building standards enable the use of earth wall materials within a decarbonisation building industry. The earth building standards provide for a range of earth building techniques and earth wall densities. The first of these techniques is adobe, which is earth mixed into a mold and cast and then air dried. In the slide on the right, we have a mixing box with the clay mix, a mixture of clay, silt, sand, and straw being mixed with a small rotary tiller. Can also be mixed with your feet or with a rotary hoe mounted on the back of a tractor. So after the, the mix is allowed to settle, preferably overnight, it's then cast in a mold. And in the background of this photograph, you can see the adobes there drying. After about a week, they're turned on their side to increase the drying process. After about a month, they're ready to stack on pallets and be taken to the building site. The 
In the left-hand slide, we have an adobe house. It's the house that I've been living in since 2005. Next technique is rammed earth, where the soil is compacted within forms. So in the left-hand photo, you see the form work. In this case, the builder used steel forms lined with plywood. And then the, the earth mix is placed into the form in layers, typically 100 to 150 millimeters thick. Usually, the mix is, is mixed with cement. It is then tamped with a mechanical tamper. On the right, you can see a rammed earth wall building, this one near Auckland. Another technique is rammed earth block, where instead of the mix being put into moulds, it, it is put into moulds rather than in form work. So on the left, we have Five Country Lodge, south of Kaikoura, which has got 400 thick earth block walls on the ground floor and a timber framed upper story. The photo on the right, we have a rammed earth block uh, winery and restaurant near Renwick in Marlborough. Another technique used widely throughout New Zealand in the 1800s, but now being increasingly used in the South Island, is cob, where the earth mix is placed directly on the wall. So in the right-hand photo, we see the mix being prepared, and the material that's used for the mix is from the bank, just in the background of this photo. So a couple of meters from the source of the material to the mix mixing location. This mix is then taken out of the mixing box and placed directly onto the wall. In this case, the building was less than 20 meters from the mixing pit. In the left-hand photo, we have the resultant building. This is the Toto's Cafe near Totonui in Golden Bay. Perhaps one of the most notable earth buildings in New Zealand, particularly one that was been built in the last century, is Broad Green House near Nelson. This was constructed in 1846. It is owned by Nelson City Council and it is still in use as a museum. It has cob walls, which are 500 millimeters thick, and on the exterior walls there is lime plaster to protect the walls from the weather. In the last few years, there's been an increasing use of low-density earth materials. These have a density of 800 to 1,200 kilograms per cubic meter, compared to more traditional density of 1,600 to 2,000 kilograms per cubic meter. The building that we saw earlier, the rammed earth buildings, they would have been in the order of 2,000 kilograms per cubic meter. The Adobe, typically about 1,800. So now we're using much, much lighter materials. So this has the advantage of better insulation and also lower earthquake bracing demand. Provision is now included in the 2020 earth building standards for these low density materials. Here we have a house that was recently constructed with low density adobes. A beautiful house. Another technique is eternal adobe brick veneer. So this comprises adobe bricks fixed eternally to timber studs to provide the acoustic and thermal mass benefits of earth within the insulated envelope. It's simple to construct and is now included in the 2020 earth building standards big advantages with having the insulation on the outside of the earth wall and the mass on the inside. Here are the typical construction details for internal adobe veneer. The diagram in 
on the left-hand side is included in the earth building standards. So you have a concrete foundation, typically three to 400 millimeters wide, a timber frame wall on the outside with studs, typically at 600 centers. And then the internal adobe wall is fixed to the interior surface of those studs. There's geogrid, typically at every other course, at 300 millimeter centers. And then there's a, a brick tie fixed into the top of the adobe brick and screw fixed into the stud. Gives a very strong wall and is very, very simple to construct. The right-hand photo, you see the construction in progress for a house there. This is being built with someone with no previous experience. It's very straightforward. They've got the existing wall to follow. The bricks are very easy to handle. The revised standards incorporate findings from surveys of earth buildings after the recent earthquakes in New Zealand, including the Darfield earthquake, the Christchurch earthquake, and the Kaikoura earthquake. For the Kaikoura earthquake, we visited about 42 buildings, and 18 of these had intensity of shaking of seven or greater. One of the main conclusions from the surveys was that reinforced earth houses performed well, provided that the wall bracing was sufficient and the construction in accordance with NZS 4299, 1998. One such house was a reinforced adobe house near Charing Cross, near Darfield. This was located between the major fault rupture and the epicenter of the Darfield earthquake with estimated intensity eight shaking. There was only slight damage, mainly some cracking in the concrete slab and some minor cracking at the corners of window and door openings. Another building that performed very well was this reinforced adobe house at Greta Valley, south of Kaikoura. There was no damage after the intensity six shaking of the Kaikoura earthquake. We went inside the building, inspected it rigorously. We couldn't find a crack. However, older unreinforced earth buildings suffered damage and required repair or re reconstruction. The diagram on the right shows the typical modes of failure that we saw when we inspected some of these older cob and unreinforced buildings. Gable walls were particularly vulnerable to damage or even collapse. Corners were also vulnerable to damage and openings. On the left-hand side, we have an old cob building where you can see the damage to the corner of the wall, which is now being held together with number eight wire. Unreinforced pressed earth brick walls perform badly, as you can see in this photo. Pull out of the ties, many of the bricks on the ground. So the recommendations following these reconnaissance surveys after the earthquakes are two-story buildings and unreinforced earth buildings should be discouraged. Vertical and horizontal reinforcing should be provided for earth buildings in all earthquake zones. The height of earth walls, and particularly gable end walls, should be appropriate to the earthquake zone. To further check out the performance of earth wall buildings, full scale out of plane tests were carried out. These were done in Nelson. There was a hinged reinforced concrete foundation beam and the tilting of the wall was done with an excavator. The tests simulate quasi-static out of plane forces. So in these photos, you can see the arrangement for the testing. On the left hand side, there's the wall mounted on the hinged concrete foundation beam and the digger is moving the wall from side to side. In the right-hand photo, at the bottom of the photo, you can see the hinged, um, 
reinforcing, reinforced concrete beam. So it's hinged there, it's a big hinge in here. So we could tilt the wall backwards and forwards. And in this photo, additional loading was provided by these sandbags, which were placed onto the wall. So the graph here shows the loading history. So the greater the tilt, greater the simulated earthquake forces. So starting off at zero, and then going backwards and forwards, first 20 degrees, backwards and forwards, 40 degrees, backwards and forwards, 60 degrees, backwards and forwards, and then finally to 80 degrees, backwards and forwards. And then after that, the sandbags were applied to the wall, as you saw in that last photo. And then we used the digger to shake the wall vigorously. The results from these tests showed that reinforced earth walls performed well with only cracks along the mortar joints, but no failure across the bricks and no dislodged bricks. The test also showed that the reinforced earth walls can undergo significant deflection without collapse. So typically span over 150, no problem. And when the wall was brought back to vertical, the, the cracks closed up. In addition to the out-of-plane tests, full-scale in-plane tests were also done in Nelson, and these were done by University of Auckland final year students, supervised by Hugh Morris. The results are well documented in a fourth-year project paper by Sean Grainey. In here, we can see the, the test set up. Sorry. So we've got the load being applied to the top of the wall, to the, to the top plate in here. And you've got the measuring devices for measuring the movements and deflections, both here and in here. It, and there's the foundation beam. So we reuse the hinged concrete foundation beam from the outer plane test. And here we see the damage in the wall when we use reach the final load. So we've got cracking through the mortar joints, but it's fairly well contained because we have the geogrid reinforcing at every other brick course. And we've also got vertical reinforcing here and vertical reinforcing here, as you would have in a typical reinforced earth wall. So here we've got um, the test results. So um, cyclic loading, the loading was taken up to a maximum load of 35 kilonewtons, which was pretty much the capacity of the testing equipment. We couldn't take it further than that. And still, there was no collapse of the wall. The design bracing capacity, in accordance with the standards, for a wall that high and that long would have been 14.4 kilonewtons. But we were able to take the wall up to a maximum load of 35 kilonewtons without collapse. So the students and Hugh assessed the ductility of this particular wall panel at 2.6. The conclusions from the in-plane tests were that the two reinforced adobe walls tested showed the ability to respond in a ductile manner. The adobe walls satisfied the seismic load requirements for a structural system with a ductility of two. The performance of the adobe walls exceeded the design bracing capacities nominated in NZS 4299 2020 by a factor of at least 2.5 without collapse. So features for NZS 4297 2020, which is the engineering design of earth buildings, the design principles are similar to those for reinforced concrete masonry and reinforced concrete, but with much lower design compressive strengths. Typically, 
0.5 for heavy earth and 0.35 MPa for low density earth. The structural ductility factor of 1.25 specified for reinforced earth walls designed for nominal ductility. This is more conservative than in the 1998 standard, which specified a factor of two for reinforced earth walls to be designed for limited ductility. Features for NZS 4298, the materials and workmanship standard, this provides details of the tests on materials and the results required. And here we have one of the tests that are specified in the standard called the flexural tensile strength test. And it's probably one of the most important tests for the quality control for the earth bricks. So here we have a test result sheet from a laboratory in Nelson where five samples have been tested at the test laboratory. And you can see the setup the modulus of rupture set up. And these are the bricks that have been tested. And the specification for this particular project was 0.25 MPA, flexural tensile strength, and the average of the five tests, 0.8. So no problem in achieving the minimum um, requirements. Features for NZS 4299. The earthquake zones and subsoil classification are same as both NZS 3604, timber frame buildings, and NZS 4229, concrete masonry buildings, not requiring specific engineering design. So maximum heights are specified for each earthquake zone. Vertical and horizontal reinforcing for earth walls is required. So in this slide, we can see the vertical steel reinforcing, typically ends of walls and maybe 900 to 1,200 millimeter centers. And then you've got the geogrid horizontal reinforcing, which is typically every other layer of bricks or at approximately 300 millimeter centers vertically. Bracing demand. The earthquake bracing demand is determined by a step-by-step -step procedure with respect to earthquake zone, subsoil classification, wall and roof dimensions, and area and density of wall. The bracing line support system is used for the design and layout of the bracing walls. For bracing capacity, similar values as was used in the 1998 standard lower capacity for lower density earth walls, and these capacities were confirmed appropriate by full-scale tests in 2019, as you saw earlier. Earth wall construction details developed and proven in New Zealand over the past 30 years are provided in NZS 4299 2020. And here we have a typical construction detail included in the standard. This is for the horizontal geogrid reinforcing. And here we have a house designed and constructed in accordance with the revised New Zealand earth building standards. The 2020 suite of New Zealand earth building standards incorporate the experience gained from the design, construction, performance, and evaluation of earth buildings since 1998. They enable the safe and successful construction of earth buildings in New Zealand and overseas. Hugh and I would like to acknowledge the enormous amount of time spent and work done by the other members of the Voluntary Technical Committee for the three standards. Thank you. Uh, just, just have a question on the or value of the Earth rammed earth walls, um, the ore value for insulation, and how is there? A, I believe the new code has halved the ore value from the the, the original code, and it's, it seems to govern the design of the thickness of the of the rammed earth wall. So, um, in the lower density materials, provide much better insulation and allow you to achieve the present requirements um, 
certainly with a 300 thick wall, which would not be possible with the uh, higher density materials. With the higher density materials to achieve the present requirements, you'd need to have insulation on the outside. But with these lower density materials, we can achieve the present requirements. Uh, I just have a current design from an architect at uh, 450 uh, thick walls, yeah. uh, rammed earth, and he wants to, he wants to put a, a middle insulation panel in the middle. <laughs> I wouldn't, uh, yeah, it, with, with the 450 thick, low density adobe, you can achieve um, the requirements. If you were going to use um, the older, uh, denser bricks, even the 450 thick walls would not make it. You'd have to put insulation on the outside. So this is why the internal adobe veneer is such a good method, because you've got that really good insulation with the timber frame wall on the outside and the mass on the inside with the adobe brick. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Richard. Um, is the detailing for reinforcing in Cobb very similar to that of Adobe? Are they interchangeable? Yeah, no, interchangeable. So in both Adobe and Cobb walls, you'd have vertical reinforcing, 150 from the end of each wall panel, and then depending on the height of the wall, you'd have intermediate vertical reinforcing, anything between 900 to 1400 centers, depending on the height of the earth wall. Mm. And the, uh, the geo grid, you lay those in the layers of cob as well? Correct. Got you. Yeah, so you'd still lay it within the layer of every 300 millimeters in the cob. Thank you. For That's rammed earth, it's more difficult to install the horizontal geo grid reinforcing. Some people have done it, um, but some feel that it could initiate uh, horizontal cracking. So for um, rammed earth walls, um, what is often done is that the vertical reinforcing is put at closer spacings to compensate for not having the horizontal reinforcing. Um, one more question here. Oh, great presentation, thanks. Um, just a question on rammed earth. Uh, testing for tensile strength and compression strength during construction, is there much guidance on how to do that? Yeah, so um, for rammed earth, you wouldn't use the flexural tensile strength test. You'd make uh, cylinders much like you do for concrete and get them tested in a similar manner as you do for concrete specimens. So people need to make a test wall before they do their house, get samples taken of the mix that they're going to use, get them tested well in advance. Thanks. Usually there's not a, no issues in, in well-made rammed earth in achieving uh, the minimum requirements usually the strengths achieved are several times greater than the minimum specified, taking a very conservative approach for the strengths required. Okay, I think we'll leave it there. Thank you, Richard. <laughs> and for the final presentation of the session, we have uh, Mark Ryburn. Mark, are you? Oh. Uh, Mark has recently started his current role this year as a senior structural engineer in the building for performance and engineering team at Envy. Prior to that, he has worked as a structural and civil engineer at WSP Opus and SKM in Wellington and a high rise commercial construction manager in London. He has been involved in a number of projects ranging from commercial to public and including building and infrastructure design and assessment. Thank you, Mark. Okay, good morning everybody. Um, apologies in advance, I don't have any quotes uh, in this presentation, but I do have a quiz. Um, so feel free to spend a few minutes. These are some of the items that I hope to cover in my presentation today. Um, there'll be answers at the end. And uh, if you do well, we may come and shoulder tap you uh, for the new chief engineer role. So um, uh, that's, <laughs> that's actually not government policy, just to let you know, but feel free to put it on your resume if you're looking to apply for that role. Uh, tēnā koto katoa. Uh, my name is Mark Ryburn. Um, thanks for coming along this afternoon. Um, I've recently started this role here, uh, been in the role about six weeks, and um, 
I'd just like to discuss a little bit today about our team, who we are, and some of the work that we're doing in 2021. So prior to uh, coming to the role, I'd worked with uh, WSP as a senior structural engineer and also did uh, worked for a construction company over in London. Uh, and I've also had a couple of years off um, come prior coming to this role as a stay-at-home father uh, for three children. So it's, um, it's a change coming back to this, but it was a, it was a nice, exciting time. So. Right. Some of you may have seen this uh, slide yesterday. I think we put it up at the main session here. I guess the intent of this was really just to let you know where we sit uh, as a group um, in the broader industry. I guess we sit where that little blue box uh, sort of down the bottom there. We're the building performance and engineering team. Uh, we've got a new manager, Jenny Tipler, who some of you may be familiar with. Uh, she's coming into that role when she comes back uh, from leave later in August. I guess the key things from this is really just trying to highlight where we sit within the broader industry. We're part of MB, um, and really just highlighting, I guess, the, the size of the industry, construction industry, and the importance it is to the economy. Uh, and also highlighting, again, the chief engineer role. And a little bit of a plug here for a, something that's come out of our group. Uh, this was released last week, I think, and this is... Um, I guess uh, it's, a, it's an app there at that link, and it gives you a bit of a temperature gauge on how the group is performing against some of the regulatory strategy um, uh, work that we're doing, and it's also got some useful stats which I used for my quiz, so I'd recommend that. So like uh, many of you, my wife and family often ask me what I do for work, um, so I decided I'd prepare this slide for them to help them out, um, and I thought I'd share it with you today. Um, so some of our roles here um, in the building performance and engineering team, uh, we're the technical stewards of the building code. So we're involved with the updates to the um, acceptable solutions and verification methods. We also, we also provide technical support to the wider BSP team. So we have policy team, we have um, systems team, education teams. So we provide uh, input into that. We also do a lot of work with Standards New Zealand, uh, commissioning and standards and being part of um, the working groups and committees. And we also carry out intergovernment liaison roles with um, organisations such as Ministry for the Environment and Ministry for Education. Hopefully, hopefully you found that slide useful. I uh, showed it to my wife and she hasn't asked me any more since, so. <laughs> uh, so who are we as a team? Um, I guess stepping back, it's, I've, I'm probably, I started six weeks ago, uh, about six weeks ago with a team, but I'm actually the, probably the longest serving member of the team because I did a role with the BIA back in 2004 on secondment with them. And so coming back to the team now, I've noticed that it's, um, it's gotten bigger since my time uh, back with the BIA, but I think a lot of people are still surprised just how small it is relative to the, to the size of the industry. So we have, within our team, there's uh, nine advisors who work on the building performance side of the team, and they look after those parts of the clauses, sort of D through H. And then in the engineering team, the team that I'm part of, uh, we look after clauses primarily, primarily B through C. Uh, there's three structural engineers, myself and Reza are based in Wellington, and we have Bruce down in Christchurch, and we've also got three fire engineers uh, spread out between uh, Auckland and Wellington, and then we've got some geotechnical engineers down in Auckland and Christchurch. And I guess looking at the size of the team versus the size of the industry, it looks like uh, a lot of ground to cover, I guess one thing that's been common since my first round through with the BIA is that the work that we do is done with the support of obviously um, organisations such as CSOC, uh, number of people individually and sort of corporately through these organisations and that allow us to do the work that we do so we're very uh, appreciative of that. Yeah. So that was a wee bit about who we are as a, as a team. 
This is a little bit of a summary of some of our work items for 2021. I'm not going to go through all of them, I'll just highlight a few. Um, you'll probably be familiar with some of them. One of the main things that we do, which I guess is keen, for, keen to publicise, is we're part of the annual building code update process. So this is obviously something that's done every year. There's a, a routine to it uh, where we try to put out consultation documents and seek uh, obviously feedback from the public on these and then look to incorporate them into the building code on a regular process. So we've recently closed the consultation on uh, for this year, for 2021, and I guess just a couple of them that were, I guess, relevant to maybe uh, CSOC, uh, CSOC members. We did a consultation here on B1. Not, did anybody, is anybody aware of this consultation that was done? Yeah, okay. So this one was, I guess, relatively straightforward this year. Um, it involved updating some references to some standards uh, in the building code that this, these standards had been updated themselves. So it was, it was well supported and pretty straightforward this year. And I guess a lot of people here are probably familiar with the standards anyway. They've been in, uh, available for a while. And a lot of it uh, incorporated. Sometimes the uh, some of the standards I think actually had just picked up stuff that was previously in the actual code, and they've now included it in the standards. Something else that was consulted on at the same time this year, um, not related to any specific code clause. I guess it sat over it was just how we as the BPE team relate uh, to standards and the standards process. And I think the intent of this was really just to try and provide some transparency to the industry and to standards about how we use standards in the building code and I guess trying to put together a framework so that we can support the standards and give some certainty for industry in terms of uh, when they'll be updated and how they'll be funded. Uh, so a tier framework was proposed. Um, tiers one through three with different standards in the different tiers based on a number of different criteria and then those tiers were then either funded or supported or updated on different intervals. There was uh, quite a bit of feedback on that. Um, we're going through those submissions at the moment and I think for me it was quite encouraging to see just how much uh, interest there was um, in that area and I think it really highlighted the fact that standards play such an important role um, in everything that's done. Uh, industry support for that and encouragement I guess for us to really work and together to, to make that process transparent. One of the other things that we're doing in the group is the Building for Climate Change program. Many of you have probably seen and you know, are aware of that. Um, I'd probably just refer you here to two other papers that have been presented at this conference here. My colleague Katie did a presentation yesterday, which I'm not sure if anybody went to. Uh, there's also another really great presentation by uh, Phoebe um, that covered all the stuff significantly better than I ever will, but I really recommend those to you all. One thing that struck or stuck out to me, I think this was um, this graph was presented in Phoebe's presentation as well as just the importance that we can play as structural engineers in this um, in the embodied carbon in these buildings. And that graph um, for me was really just highlighted that we are part of this process and we can, as structural engineers, can really have um, a positive impact in that. So as I mentioned, we do a lot of work with standards. Um, some of the standards that we're working on at the moment, just a quick highlight. Uh, we're working on 3604, the update to that. Um, I'm not sure if people here are involved in that, but it will probably be something that you're all interested in. That's a multi-year uh, project that's ongoing at the moment. I think one of the things that's come out from that, the, the notes I got given, was that the scope is being expanded on that, one of the, to cover three-storey buildings. Um, so that will be quite a big change uh, to support the high-density work that the government is um, looking to do.
The next one is one that I'm looking to work on with um, a number of people. Uh, this is for the update to 3404. I had to double check when I sort of looked at it. It's 1997, so this uh, the standard's been around for quite a while. It's obviously had a, a, an update early in there, but it's amazing that um, the guys putting this together, I, I wonder if they imagined it would have such such a long life. Um, but it's due for, a, due for an update, and we're starting out on that process at the moment. Um, yeah. And then finally, one that may, um, that's been done at the moment is around the earth fill uh, for residential development. That's something a colleague's working on down in Christchurch, and I think that's due for public consultation later on this year. So uh, a lot of you are probably aware of the update that GNS are doing to the National Seismic Hazard Model. Um, and that's something that is uh, a long-term project. Again, is going to be released uh, later August next year, I understand. There's a work program that's going on around that. Um, being relatively recent, I don't have a lot of details on it, but I do know that it's quite a big piece of work and it's something that the group is starting to get involved in now so we can look to incorporate the updates from that. I think these updates are generally going to be in sort of three main areas. Uh, we've got um, incorporating the outputs into the loadings, looking at the way it's incorporated into seismic design and analysis, and also um, the geotechnical impacts of it. And as you can see, it's going to be a long-term project. So that's all I've got to cover today. I guess really just wanting to highlight again um, the importance of the partnerships that we have with, uh, with many industries and organisations and just acknowledge that. Um, we really value that and it's, I think it's really neat to see this uh, two-way process that's, that's done with the industry. And some answers. Thanks. I guess um, there's a lot of work going on um, in, in a whole range of areas which will have quite a big impact on the industry. And there's probably a bit of a view that a lot of it gets done and then not necessarily, you know, nobody gets to see it until it's finished. Have you got any thoughts on how some of that work could be shared in, a, in an informal manner perhaps with the industry as it progresses? Yeah, that's a good question. That's something that I'm looking at at the moment. I had a discussion with I think Rick earlier on about um, trying to extract sort of value from the process as it goes along. Um, I don't think I've come to an answer yet, but um, I think possibly one way is working with the, there's obviously a lot of collaboration, is looking to organisations such as CSOC and see how we can perhaps extract value through that process and, and sort of get it out there. Yeah. <laughs> 